I got to say, I, one of the things I'm most happy about is that I started doing this podcast. Sometimes people are like, how many podcasts? Do you have like 12 podcasts? But this podcast allows me to have long form conversations with people that I really want to talk to. And it's so different than, than you know, your mom's house, which is a, a fun but crazy, you know, clip show and a comedy show. And we always try to, we try to be reckless and irresponsible and silly on it. And then, you know, uh, two bears, one cave, which is just a listening experience for me. Um, this is a, is a place where I, I get to reach out to people. I go, I've always wanted to talk to this person. Literally, that's, that's what we do. We, we sit down and we go, who do you want to talk to? And I've always wanted to talk to Jose Andres. Most, at first, it was just because, look, I like to eat. I mean, I love great food. I love great restaurants. And he is a legendary, you know, like award-winning, this is a top-tier, world-class chef. And like that in and of itself is fascinating, you know, to talk to somebody with that skill and that experience. On top of that, the guy is so philanthropic and charitable and, and really an outspoken advocate for humanity, feeding people, as an organization called World Central Kitchen, which you will hear us talk about. But I just wanted to set this up for you that this guy is an incredible chef. I mean, a truly world-class chef. You look up Think Food Group and you see he has a host of, of really well-known restaurants and they're, they're just incredible places to have an experience and a great, great meals. And then what he's doing uh, charitably is, uh, you know, I think what everybody would aspire to do, like really helping people in need, people who are hungry. Had a great time. He's also hilarious. So here is my chat with the one and only Chef Jose Andres. Oh, fumando un puro. What are we smoking today, Mr. Andres? No, I'm not smoking. I'm having my vegetables. Oh, you're... <laughs> the the you. The USDA recommends that you have uh, <laughs> four servings of vegetables, and I'm having four oh, that right fantastic. now, right here. Which one is that? What kind is that? Uh, we, I don't know if I, I mean, uh, yeah, I am an American citizen now. Uh, that's uh, the Partagas, the Maduro number three. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah. I'll, I smoke a stick from now and now and then. You're doing it indoors. That's a real baller move right there. No, no. You, when you hear a scream, yeah. it's my wife that you should find out because yeah. I was going to do it outside, but the Wi-Fi is not working so oh, well. Perfect. Five meters on the left. And anyway, here it seems it's good. But I got to tell you, I'm a huge fan of yours. And let me first begin by saying I can't believe that my producer had the fucking balls to ask you if you know how to make hummus. So I apologize on behalf of all of us. <laughs> I, I mean, come on. I, mean, yeah, I, I know. forgive him. I, I mean, almost fucking hit I him forgive, in the head. I forgive him. I mean, Thank you. come on. I mean, I mean. I yeah, mean, it's embarrassing. I mean, I, let's just, let's just young, say, uh, we're embarrassed. He's a young man. He he's a young man. Better. He doesn't I know mean, any better. He's learning English. You know, it's, it's fine. I mean, yeah, you know, it's okay. I forgive him. I will never use this against him in public. <laughs> Thank you. Only, only in my memories, in my memoirs, if I write them one day. I don't like anybody wants to read. <laughs> Please them, make it the opening paragraph of your memoir. Yeah, very much. <laughs> I remember that young Israeli, <laughs> that because my accent, he implied. Okay, yeah, no, yeah. No, chickpeas. Like, do you know I mean, who I am, motherfucker? I mean, I mean, I mean. Do I you know how to make hummus? He really seems a good guy, and this should never ever be used against his. Uh, uh, Whatever. Let me know, go. Let me go out so. on a on a limb here. Have you ever tried uh, paella? Ever heard of something like that, sir? Anything ever occur to you? I mean, like <laughs> paella is like every time. You know, many years ago, I began telling people that mm -hmm. they should do a paella on Sundays. Yeah. Um. Uh. Because I said that would be a great way to build a bridge between Spain and America. Yeah. And many people do that. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they put every single uh, item from the animal kingdom and In they there. find. Yeah. So the paella is not. But oh, me, yeah. I try used to empower them and I tell them, keep trying. Yeah, yeah. Good, good job, good effort. Yeah. But <laughs> people in people in um, in Spain uh, cities in Valencia and they attack me yeah. because they cannot believe that I'm telling somebody. Good try. Good try. I'm yeah. trying to tell him. I cannot bitch on them. So everybody hits me. 
for trying to give hope to the people that try to make paella and I'm always in the hot in the hot seat anyway. Well, what is by the way cuz I remember when I when I I I studied in in Madrid when I was in in college for 6 months and I remember uh having a paella where they told me that there's when you scrape the bottom of of the of the plate there was a name for the scrapings no yeah the, that's the sucarrat which is a catalan name okay sucarrat s o c a r r a t sucarrat and that's like prized this, right that's delicious this is no easy to achieve uh-huh. uh to perfection but many different cultures have that uh, the Persians, the Iranians, many other cultures have that, that the rice, when gets a stick to the bottom, is slightly brown, Yeah, um, becomes like the best bite. But first, people need to learn how to make um, the right paella sure. from the scratch in order, in order to hope to be... It's like getting the sukarat is like getting, you Black know, belt. scoring a hole... Yeah. Uh, no, a hole in one. Oh, okay. In the oh, okay. Corner. On the part three, I mean, give me a break. It's okay, like, okay. It ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. You don't know how to play golf. Okay. So the sukarat is the hole in one of uh, the cooking wall. Holy shit. Okay, I was not aware of that. Um, so that's yeah. something that, um, guess what, Nadav? He can do that too. Now, uh, <laughs> the, I fir- okay, I'm a big fan of yours. I first, when I moved to, I moved to Los Angeles many years ago and I first heard of you because I, like many people, one of the great things about living in a, in a major city is going out to restaurants and having like so many options and going to the bazaar is an experience. And it's so fun, like the first time you experience it, but it's also one of the joys of going there is, is once, once you know what it is, is bringing people there and watching somebody have an experience. And I think like that's one of the great thrills of great restaurants, you know, it's not just, it's not just, oh, I like this dish. It's like the whole experience, man. It is a thrill to go to that place. And I've been to multiple uh, restaurants of yours, but to go back to where you started in Spain, can you tell me what it is, was like to, to cook or learn to cook even at El Bulli? Um, because it's, it seems like for people that don't know, you know, there's there's levels to this thing, man. And there's levels to the restaurant game. And you, one of your, I mean, it had to be one of your first jobs, right? Yeah, it was not the first, but but was, uh, I had a few others, believe it or not. I began cooking very much when I was 14, 15. What happened is during the summers, I will go to this uh, little town north of Barcelona, two hours. Mm-hmm. Uh, very close from France, from the border. And that was a beautiful seafood town, a, a sea town uh, with a lot of uh, fishing happening and tourism. And uh, I began working as a cook in this restaurant uh, that was a seafood restaurant. And quite frankly, it was great because it was the chef, uh, his wife, myself, uh, dishwasher, that's it. So I got uh, to learn uh, very early on, because I had to do very much everything. In a summer restaurant in Spain, you are very busy and you are working like 16, 18 hours a day. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, uh, Ferran Adria uh, uh, began coming to my restaurant, I guess, when he ended his shifts in his, mm-hmm. um, because my restaurant was open until very late and was downtown in the little, in the little village. He will sit in the bar and he will order gamba salajillo, uh, garlic shrimp, uh, shrimp. I cannot believe anybody came up with an A, an H, and an R together. I mean, it's the most difficult word in English ever. Uh, <laughs> shrimp, mm-hmm. uh, and and it's how I got to know him. Uh, happens that I am being the chef of that restaurant, not because I was the best at the time, but the chef quit and I was the next one in line, and boom, there I am. Uh-huh. That's how I got to meet him. He was very young himself. Uh, he's uh, eight, nine years. Uh, we are eight uh, years apart. But when you are so young, eight years is a lot right. of yeah, a lot of years. Uh, and the next season, when uh, was the the time to think about what to do in summer? Obviously, I already knew I wanted to work there. I was able to go to his restaurant uh, before uh, eating because the mother of a friend was paying for our meal. So in my day off, the only day off I got in the entire summer, 
I was able to go, but yeah, I fall in love with what he was doing. It was something he was mesmerizing. It was something that like was ahead of his time. Yeah. And quite frankly, it's almost like if you are a fisher, you are into physics or you're trying to be a Stephen Hawking and you're trying to explain yeah. how the universe began. Very much working with him in uh, almost 30 years ago, uh, over 30 years ago, 35 years ago, was very much like if I was watching the Big Bang yeah. in real time. Yeah. When you speak about culinarily, he didn't invent <laughs> cooking, but very much he came up with a very new way, new language, new way to see things that was very ahead of his time, very ahead of any anybody else, including even what was happening in France. So for me, I was very lucky that I was in that big bang of cooking with him. Obviously, he's my mentor. Uh, obviously, he's my one of my best friends. Uh, and the most amazing thing about Ferran Adria, yes, he invented many new techniques, mm -hmm. many amazing dishes, but he was the most giving person I've ever met. He was the one that decided that everything he knew and everything he will come up with, he will always share it with everybody else. That's such, and that made yes. him a very different person. That the people like that I've found are so unique and few and far between because really what people hoard the most, and this goes for culinary things, uh, technology, it's information. So like when they figure something out or they know something, a lot of people, their instinct is to hoard the information. They go, I know this thing now and um, I, it's mine and I will, I will not share it because if I share it, then I'm no longer the one person that knows the information. You got it. I mean, if he was running the vaccine labs around the world right now, mm -hmm. Imagine how generous he was, and he still is. Yeah. Every single person on planet Earth probably will be having the vaccine by now. Yeah. This is that type for of everybody person. to understand yeah. what type of person he was uh, and how creative he was. So, uh, I, you know, I was uh, very lucky. How did I ask you, like, that first time you went there and you had that experience, were you also intimidated? Like, was it intimidating to, to experience, you know what I mean, to, as, as the... The, the, the chef in you, you're like, can I do this? Am I capable of this? I, I, I was not intimidated by what I was seeing on the plate uh, because uh, very much um, uh, I was at the very beginning of him uh, exploding into what he became. Mm -hmm. uh, he was more uh, getting into modernizing the traditional recipes of Catalonia, of Spain, mm -hmm. and even other parts of the world. Uh, uh, was amazing. Like he will come up with this uh, chicken curry that uh, the waiter will tell you leg or breast. Yeah. And at the end, uh, what you will see in the plate had no chicken on the plate that you could recognize. Yeah. And actually it was an ice cream that uh, had the, the sauce of uh, concentrated uh, sauce of chicken that was roasted with the ice cream uh, uh, of curry uh, with touches of apple. I mean, he was in many ways uh, already showing that he was going to be changing the way the culinary world uh, thinks about cooking. What I was intimidated was that I was very young and I still I remember uh, walking in front of the one, two, three star Michelin restaurants outside yeah. to try to get a glimpse anytime anybody opened the door and at the most sometimes only being dreaming of what it was like being inside by reading the menu. Yeah. So the intimidation came more from what the heck I'm doing here yeah, yeah. more than what I was seeing on the plate. Yeah, I, that makes sense. It's like the anxiety of, it's like the anxiety you have of having an uncomfortable conversation versus having the, con you worry more before you have the conversation, you know? Um, so was that the most insane, like learning experience when you worked there? I mean, I feel like that has to be, there's nothing like that, nothing. You know, you know what was very amazing? I remember uh, one of the most traditional dishes that you can see in Spain today, and it's a dish that uh, you find now in other cultures, well, well because uh, Spanish influence or well because whatever yeah. that dish ended in those countries. Uh, croquetas. Yeah. Croquetas is this amazing uh, bechamel where you will add Traditionally, some chicken or some ham, some serrano ham, or even better, iberico, 
or even can be as simple as use a boiled egg. Mm -hmm. Croquetas was not something you created from a scratch from whole ingredients. Croquetas, my mom will make them out of the scraps towards the end of the month when the refrigerator in my house looked like a Best Buy refrigerator, yeah, meaning yeah, yeah, it was very yeah. much empty. Yeah. Uh, and my mom will be this magical person that out of the leftover of a little piece of chicken breast and a half a boiled egg that nobody ate, she will do this bechamel, add all those things, and croquetas will show up on the dinner table like by magic. My brothers and I, we love those dishes all the end of the month. Yeah. I barely recall any dish at the beginning. So Ferran, I remember one time, uh, we were working on a almond gelatin. Uh, but for people to understand, an almond gelatin at the end doesn't need any flour to be thick. Is the gel, the gelatin that you add to the almond milk and becomes thick when it becomes cold. You follow me? Mm -hmm. So this at the end is used a liquid, like it was water, in this case almond, that has body because the gelatin makes the structure uh, very hard and goes from a liquid to this gelatin that we all recognize. Right. I had the pot of fry of hot oil where I was frying uh, artichoke chips and beets and, and other vegetables that uh, beyond potatoes that made these amazing chips. In that moment, I saw Ferran, like it was a hunting dog, began walking down on that, up and down the kitchen near me. And he was looking at the almond gelatin that was in my station, that was one of the garnishes of one dish, and began looking at the oil. The three, four other guys in the kitchen, we began looking at each other like, oh, my God, don't tell me that he's thinking about it. We were not talking. We then had to talk. It was like a Star Trek movie yeah. where all of a sudden those aliens were connecting only by looking at us and sending messages through the waves. Ferran got the gelatin and he went into the hot oil. If you use logic, yeah, logic will tell you that a hot, a, a cold liquid, you know. even if it's hard because gelatin, you know that gelatin melts under heat. Therefore, the heat, once it melts, becomes liquid. And what happens with water and hot oil? Oh, it's a big mess. They don't like each other. No. Everybody knows that yeah. hot oil uh, and and, war, uh, and liquids, they don't like each other. The, yeah. It's not like they don't like each other. It's like, hey, man, leave me alone. Ah, no. no, I want to be here. I don't want you to be here. Boom, it's an explosion. Yes. Okay, that's fine. People can behave. Liquids can behave in any way they want sure. as well as people. It's not the right thing to do, but that's how they behave. Right. I'm not going to criticize them in public right now. Okay. <laughs> yes. You and I, yeah. I will never do it. Yeah. Ferran was the guy that didn't learn by following yes. the pre, the rules of the past, what everybody thought they knew. Ferran is a person that will trial an error yeah. with boots on the ground, will find out on his own. Obviously, it was a big explosion. Yeah. If I take you 10, 15 years later, Ferran Adria came up with a liquid croqueta, changing very much the parameters, still using a gelatin, yeah. a very thin gelatin that will become liquefied in the moment the hot oil will melt the gelatin. But the way he did it, using a very thin pasta lasagna like to wrap the gelatin and then rolling that little cube into traditional flour, egg wash, and breadcrumbs, frying it like the traditional one. You looking at it and you will say it's a traditional croqueta like the one my mom made, right, my but, mother made. But and then when you put it on your mouth, yeah. bah, was liquid. Explosive. You see, that was Ferran. Yeah. He used the failure not to say, oh, man, I'm yeah. giving up. Yeah. But he used the failure to learn. So therefore, in the future, he could apply that failure to achieve success. This is very much for run 101. I was very lucky I was with him in my early days. I'm very lucky I was with him through his career and him through my career. And who was going to say that at the end, Ferran and myself, we end teaching next to two professors at the Department of Physics at Harvard for the last 12 years. Incredible. Physics through cooking. Yeah. You see, Ferran Adria was, is, and will be one of the not only most influential chefs in the history 
was one of the most influential creative people in, in, in the 20th century. Incredible. That is absolutely, I mean, and also like, it, it just makes you think, you know, it's such a departure from how you think of chefs and cooking. Like, you know, I mean, most, most like people think of cooking as here's a traditional dish, learn how to master this dish, which I guess is probably part of your upbringing and, and the process. But where you guys go with it is a whole other thing, man. It's like, just like what you're describing now with the, the almond jelly. I mean, you know, I don't think even people that really know how to cook ever, ever even envision things like this. Well, uh, and this was like dishes uh, over the years I created uh, once I became obviously uh, part of America that uh, I remember uh, doing uh, the Philly cheesesteak. Yeah. But my way. Your way. Uh, I love chili, Philly cheesesteaks, but obviously at mini bar, uh, I want to, to be racing the experience. Uh, some people will say, but what's wrong with the traditional Philly cheesesteak? You say, it's nothing wrong. Yes. But uh, uh, what happened? Only the people in the past who could come up with new dishes. So today, right. I only have to do the dishes that people did the last 2,000 years. Well, why? Why I need to be chained to the past? Yeah. I re that you're trying to create new things doesn't mean you don't respect the past. True. It's all the contrary. You respect it very much so. But at the end, what I did was we needed to recreate the bread. But I didn't want a lot of bread. I wanted only the right amount. We used the technique of a pita bread, a small pita bread that we actually overcook it. What happened with the pita bread when you overcook it? It, crunchy, it becomes right? like a pill becomes like a pillow. Oh, right, right. becomes right. hollow inside. Yep. And because it was hollow and overcooked, you will have this pita bread pillow-like, very crunchy in the outside, totally empty and hollow inside. Right. Then we'll get cheese. But no any cheese. We will make like a cheese whiz, but became like a cheese mousse that was hot and is very light, Jesus. using nitro oxide. And we will put that inside the hollow pita pillow like bread and then we will put a puree of onion above the pita and then i will get kobe beef and we will put thin slices of the kobe beef right above god damn it and then you will bring that bite into your mouth sometimes with truffles if they were in season just adding the two the two punches and when you bring that piece of of the bread with the cheese inside with amazing onion puree with amazing Kobe beef and you'll put it into your mouth and everything will be light, but every bite will be full of flavor. All of a sudden, I was not trying to say, I don't like the traditional. I like the traditional very much. Yes. But as a creative chef, I was saying, can we bring another layer yes. to that traditional dish? That was one of the creations at the end. I remember the newspaper in Philadelphia, they requested that my green card and citizenship be revoked. <laughs> uh, 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 I think somebody even wrote an editorial about it. Jesus. Uh, and, uh, By the way, and I'm going to leave it there. You describing that Philly cheesesteak that you made, and I don't, I don't think you were trying to, but I felt like you were seducing me. Like, I really well, was. Uh, Tom, yeah. behind you is three little letters that says YMH, yes. which I thought it means young men hungry. So <laughs> if you're hungry, I'm trying to feed you Please. Through, through the airways. Listen, if you invite me, I'm coming to your house, man. Okay? I just, just know I that. I mean, why, why are we doing this through Zoom? Why are we not doing it in person, man? Hey, look, I mean, really? I, I've got a lot of miles, bro. I'll, I will get on a plane. You know, I used to live in D.C. I, I, had, uh, I had two experiences of living there. I, as a, I interned at America's Most Wanted, which shot on Wisconsin Avenue. And so I, my uncle and aunt had a home in Georgetown, which was amazing. And so I'm a college kid living in Georgetown. Then I graduate and they hired me and I call up my uncle and aunt and they're like, no, you already lived here. So then I moved to College Park and, uh, and I commuted there for amazing. a while. Yeah, so. I met somebody that worked at America's Most Wanted, Phil Lerman. I don't know if oh. he still was with you when. I don't know. He, he wore many years there as one of the producers. Yeah, yeah. It was a, it was a great gig. Um, you know, you're, you're talking about reinventing uh, like or reimagining some of these dishes. I remember vividly, and I didn't look this up. I, it's in my head, and, and you stuck it in my head now every time I have it. Because I think I saw you in an interview 
few years back on 60 Minutes. Is that right? And, and you said this thing and I was like, God damn it, you've ruined this for me. You said like when you eat steak, you're like, you eat a bite of steak and you're like, it's good, it's meat. And then the next bite, it's like the same thing. And then you keep eating it and you're like, that's oh, like 50 bites of the same thing. And I'm like, yeah. And now every time I eat steak, I'm like, fuck, Jose Andres is my head telling me I'm eating the same bite. And you're like, you know, mix it up, like try different things. Like, and that's what like part of the philosophy at the bazaar, I think was like, you know, make it an experience and like the explosion of wrapping something in something else. And you're like, more's going on than just a salty, meaty bite. But it's not only that. You put a piece of a steak in your mouth, and for the record, okay? Yeah. I I love a steak. Great. Yeah, of course. But they make sure that every bite counts. Yeah. If I can eat different cows and different oxes <laughs> and different parts of the animal. Yes. Don't tell me that's not much more fun than use, hey, another ribeye. Right. Another T-bone. Give me a break. Yeah. The animal has many different parts that should be enjoyed. Yeah. But even worse, when you put a big steak in your plate and you put one piece, and the first 10 seconds, all the juices are going yeah. through your mouth, your tongue, your nostrils. You are like, mm, this is so good. But then what happened? All those juices disappear. And then you are stuck for the next 40 seconds, like if you were a lion in the middle of. Uh, the Africa wilderness, <laughs> munching something like it's odorless, tasteless. Yeah. And you are like, you cannot even talk because no. if you talk, everybody sees you have a big ball of nothingness in your mouth. <laughs> it's like a black hole at this point. True. And you are like, what the heck? I have to go through these 20 times. It's yeah. like mad, man. Yes. So I don't want that moment where you are munching uh, uh, without enjoyment. Yeah. I want everybody to count every second to count. And at the end of the day, that's what you're a chef. You're trying to bring the best possible experience to every one of the people that decide to put in you the, the, the responsibility to bring them the best experience. Yeah. Well, you definitely do that, man. I, I want, I, I want to experience all of your restaurants just because I'm such a fan of what you do. One that I didn't know about that I've recently learned about is a uh, uh, China Chilcano because I grew up a lot of, spent a lot of time in Peru and um, a big thing there, a lot of people don't like, don't know a lot about Peru, but Peru has a, an immense um, Asian population and very much part of the Peruvian culture is chifa, which is how the, that's the colloquialism, the local term for Chinese food. There's also a huge Japanese population. I mean, they had a Japanese president for crying out loud who sent in a fax that he was resigning, but, uh, but that, you know, it's incredible culinary scene. People don't know that that is a, it's a real destination to eat. People go take trips to Peru just to eat the food there. Yep. Amazing dishes. Ceviche is a Peruvian dish that has very much been duplicated by a lot of cultures, but there's a lot, just an incredible cuisine there. And then I learned you have this restaurant, but you also spent time in your research and development in Peru. Will you tell me what that was like for you? Yeah, uh, the, the Japanese, obviously the Chinese, as you mentioned, the Chifa, the Japanese, as they call it, the Nikkei. Mm -hmm. And then is the more traditional uh, Peruvian, which all the influences of the uh, natives there yes. and, and the influences that came from Spain and other countries. Sure. Uh, so very much is a, a, an amazing, uh, sophisticated melting pot. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, the restaurant I was going to open was a Chinese restaurant. Uh, I spent also a lot of time in China. One of my best friends of childhood happens became the ambassador of Mexico in China. Wow. Out of that work, I did a Mexican Chinese restaurant, which was not an invention. It's actually a city in Mexico called Mexicali that has over three, 4,000 Chinese descendants where if you go right now, uh, comes from the days of building the railroad uh, in the United States, and then they moved to Mexico, and then they were trying to kick them out, and they moved into the desert. They created that city, and now you find a lot of amazing mix of Chinese tacos with duck tongs, mm -hmm. uh, and I did that. And then I wanted to follow with something else. I was opening a Chinese restaurant only, but then I'm in this uh, already a few trips to per Peru, 
we were having one pisco sour oh, uh, yeah. too many. Mm-hmm. Pisco is an amazing uh, liquor uh, drink uh, that uh, they produce in Peru. I know you know it, of but course, yes. for your the audience. audience. Yes, yes. And the pisco sour can be one of the most unbelievable things. Yes, it can uh, be. That, uh, like if you are moving to a better life, I mean, use move to a better life, use having pisco sours. The best. Believe me, it, it, it's the way to do it. And so I'm with Gaston Acurio. With Gaston Acurio, without a uh, without a doubt, is one of the most talented people, chefs. If he wanted to become the president of Peru right now, he could be, uh, because he will be elected uh, without uh, any 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 thought. Uh, and and I was there, uh, and he's like the pope of uh, Peruvian cooking. Mm-hmm. Even his many chefs in Peru doing an amazing job. Uh, uh, and I taught him right there with. Uh, 20 pisco sours in my body uh, and, and I'm like hey Gaston what do you think if I open a Peruvian Chinese Japanese restaurant Yeah. and in that moment he said that's a great idea Jose and I will go to the opening to support you and I call my partners right there the architects where we were already almost in construction yeah. and you know can be very expensive yeah. uh, and I was like stop it we are opening a Peruvian restaurant with Chinese and Japanese influences. That's the way it happened. Uh, I think we did a great job. I think uh, I don't try to, uh, I know we are in a moment that sometimes in my profession, if anybody that is not from that ethnic background tries to to adventure yes. in something like it's not your cooking, you can be criticized. Sure. Uh, I don't think that's fair. And I don't think that's right because I do believe that everybody should be willing to express himself freely in any way or form yes. uh, they want. I think the the world is a better place because we all have influences and we've yeah. learned from other places. And that's the way it is. And that's the way I believe. But me, when I did it, obviously I have great Peruvian people with me, great Japanese and Chinese people with me. The restaurants are successful because I have uh, an ama- amazing group of individuals around and and that's all I have to say about that. That's awesome. I I can't wait. I can't wait to try it. Um, and there, like, there's a whole host of of your restaurants I want to try. But I also wanted to talk about because, dude, this is. I mean, you you first of all, you're a true American immigrant success story. I know you came, you arrived here with basically nothing, and look what you've built, which is awesome. But you've also really given back with with World Central Kitchen. I I mean, I learned about this pretty early on and, uh, you know, donated the humble brag, uh, a, a few times, because I think it's such an incredible thing that you're doing. I think it started with the, uh, the earthquake in 2010, right. in in Haiti, you know, one, but like, I know the, like the mission and, and of what you do is to feed people. Like people need to eat in these disaster when these natural disasters happen. And, and, and you've, you've done it multiple times, one of the things I wanted to ask you, because you, I'm always curious about this, like when I, I've seen it on the news, you know, you, you were in Puerto Rico when, when, the, when the hurricane was, was there most recently. Logistically, I go like, how did, like, when there's an earthquake and you go, I'm going to Haiti or Puerto Rico after a hurricane and you get there, like how logistically do you, where do you go when you get off a plane and there's been this epic natural disaster? Like, where do you go? Where do you stay? How do you how do you even pull this off? Uh, it looks uh, it looks complicated, but it's not. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, I, I began uh, trying to you know I feed the few, and I always said I wanted to feed the many. Mm-hmm. I began working in our organization as a volunteer, peeling potatoes next to an ex convict or homeless, yep, or veterans that they were very much in the streets. This organization took them in, trained them to be cooks, provide them with a little salary at the beginning, a place to sleep, giving them a place to belong. In the process, they will learn a profession. In the process, they will be in charge of producing thousands of meals every day to feed the hungry in Washington, D.C. This was founded by Robert Egger, my my food fighter mentor. Uh, Robert told me that charity seems is about the redemption of the giver when charity and philanthropy should be about the liberation of the receiver. Mm-hmm. I learned a ton about how a plate of food could change the life of a community and of the people. We talk about food waste, Tom, but we are always having the wrong conversation. It's yeah. never been about food waste. 
It's been about not wasting people's lives. Robert Egger very much planted that seed on me. When Katrina happened, I was very young, too young. I couldn't leave my job. But me, I was kind of very upset to see on the news how we had thousands of Americans in an arena, in a sports arena, yeah, uh, going hungry for days. Um, it's crazy. And many things happen. It's crazy. You know what an arena? You know what an arena is? People have it wrong. A stadium and arena is not a sports venue. It's actually a gigantic restaurant that entertains with the sports. Yeah. So I I wish I could go back in time and be there. But that moment very much planted the seat on me and saying, hmm, I cannot allow this to happen. When Haiti happened, I went there with one thing in mind to learn, to start seeing how I could be part of the solution in emergencies, feeding fellow citizens of the world. So Puerto Rico, probably I began doing this in Haiti and then we are very present in Haiti. We have schools, we do, but uh, we've been going to hurricanes, the explosion in Beirut uh, yeah. used last year. Uh, we went to Bahamas, category five, uh, that destroy uh, Abaco and Grand Bahamas and more than 16 islands were underwater. Uh, how do we do it? Uh, it's always food around. It's always a kitchen somewhere. Uh, but more important, boots on the ground. Many organizations, everybody in business or nonprofits, everybody is planning all the time. You know what we do that is very different, and I think everybody saw this in 2020, that if you plan too much, Tom, mm -hmm. at the end, when things don't go as planned, your teams freeze in adversity. Yeah. When you, when you have the mentality of adaptation, of you rolling with the punches, adaptation wins the day over the planning. Yeah. Because in the planning, and they tell you, Go through this road until you get to the top of the mountain. What happens if you have a very big rock in the middle of the a very big rock in the middle of the road? Yeah, that people freeze. Oh, we have a rock. What do we do? Let's move the rock. Why, why, why you don't go around the rock? Why you don't go over the rock? Why yeah. you don't find another path? In our case, we adapt, and that's what we do. Why we do what we do? Because we go there with more software mm -hmm. than hardware. Yeah, And with the software, which is software that is part empathy from the heart, uh, adaptation from the brain, we are able to overcome any situation. In Bahamas, when everything was very much total destruction and nobody knew how to start helping, mm -hmm. we landed while the hurricane still was north of the Bahamas. Technically, we couldn't even fly there, but we did fly. We got six helicopters, two seaplanes, one boat from Fort Lauderdale giving support to Grand Bahama, bringing half a million tons on every trip, half, uh, half a million tons on every trip. Before four days, we were delivering every single day to hundreds of different locations, 80,000 meals every single day, Amazing. 50 medical evacuations. We were able to bring chainsaws. We were able to bring generators. We were able to bring water filtration systems for seawater. And at the end, we were an organization that technically we were not even an official organization helping the people of Bahamas. That's how we do it. That's how we roll. And quite frankly, through the years, our teams, we're getting more and more experience. I try to go many times when it's the very big events from the very beginning. Uh, and I always try to be uh, next to my teams when the events are maybe not so big, but they're still why? Because I try to keep being there, trying to keep sharing what I learned yeah. and try to keep learning what I don't know. And this way we keep we keep moving forward. We keep responding. Like in this pandemic alone, almost 50 million meals. And in the middle of all that, fires in California and Colorado, uh, 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 what happened, uh, the retro that hit Iowa and Des Moines so badly, hurricanes in Lake Charles, Louisiana, yes. helping Honduras, Horrible. Venezuela, Guatemala, and Colombia, Indonesia with an earthquake, or the last, which has been the big volcano explosion in St. Vincent. We are there within hours of that kind of event occurring. And because we are quick and fast, and we have a very clear mission. Feed the hungry and bring water to the thirsty. All the team understands that, and they do whatever it takes to try to be successful. And the urgency of now for, for us means yesterday. So every minute we waste is one minute too late. We try to be next to the people as fast and as quick.
we can. It's it's incredibly inspiring, man. It it really is. Like I, I mean, I, like I said, I've I've read about it. I've seen it on the news. It's also one of those things where I mean, I don't know if this sounds terrible to say, but you're always. I think when you like when you want to be charitable and you're looking for organizations, it's it can be overwhelming to to like like see you know so many and yours resonated i think because i see what i see the mission i see what you guys are doing and i go like oh i want to contribute to that like that's that's how it affected me when i first saw it i'm like oh this this is something that i want to get behind i want to donate to this because you know i i see how the need and i see what you guys are doing it, it's it's really i mean it's it's inspiring man it really is it it motivates me um so i think it's really it's really cool when you get when you get to some of the disaster zones, is there food there for you to work with immediately or does it have to be, there is stuff there? Uh, for example, in Bahamas, uh, uh, yeah, in the initial days, the destruction in the two big islands in the north plus the 12th, 14th case was very much nothing. Yeah, uh, That's why I began getting um, helicopters because the boats were too far away from the uh, Nassau, the capital. Yeah. And the only way to do it was cooking in Nassau, which we had a great uh, big kitchen from a hotel that helped us a, a lot. Atlantis, I have a restaurant there. Yeah. So everything helped. But those guys were amazing. They gave us every single facility. Uh, the, the government, the president Obama gave us a, a heli, a heliport. So we didn't have to be going through the main airport. So to simplify the, yeah. the process, uh, but very much sometimes uh you need to remember one thing though some of the bigger problems we face they have very simple solutions sometimes some people they seem to be willing just to talk about how difficult everything else i don't know why yeah but i sincerely believe that big problems they have very simple solutions and we humans uh, we try to overcomplicate things or at least show that oh this has no solution no in our case, very often we have we know where the food is. Why? Because I'm a chef. I'm, I know every day. I know every single chef in planet Earth, and and if I don't know them, they know about us. And if they don't know about us, and we don't know them, at the end we connect. Why? Because we share a universal language. Yeah. Why? Because food people like to feed people. Yeah. And, and 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 locals know better how to provide relief. When we went to Beirut, we got the ten best kitchens, the ten best chefs. That in the moment we landed. They put their kitchens and their teams at the disposal of feeding the people of Beirut. We didn't feed the people of Beirut. The people of Beirut fed the people of Beirut. What we bring, obviously, is the, the quickness, the, the expertise, the, 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 the wind behind the cells to say, guys, if we become one, yeah. we can do it. Yeah. We were doing 20,000 meals a day within Jesus. 48 hours. Why? Because it's always food. It's always helpers. It's always empathy. It's always people that... They say, you know, I want to help. Some people do it in the distance with money. Some people fly on their own and they show up. They don't even tweet. Uh, uh, they show up and like, well, Jose, I'm here. I came from from Australia. And great, come and help. Yeah. But then we use locals better than anybody. Sure. We are an organization that we understand that the true power of us is that we help the locals help themselves they help us at the end, we become one. And that's why always we seem to find solutions to every one of the challenges that we, that we see ahead. That's awesome. You, you're like one of the only people who I feel like I've heard say that, that, that COVID is a disaster on the level of, well, when we think of natural disasters where, you know, there's people that are starving and people out of work and that we should be treating them like it was a hurricane or an earthquake or something, you know? No, I, I didn't hear that that often. Uh, especially at the very beginning of COVID, yeah. uh, Tom, um, um, I know that became uh, politicized. And, and I think that uh, we are living in a moment that uh, needs, uh, or, you are, or you are Republican or you are Democrat. Yeah. And, and if you are one or the other, who doesn't think like you is your enemy? Why? I yeah. have plenty of friends that they are on the right side of an issue, on the left side of an issue. Sure. Every point of view, if it's done with respect, yeah, with arguments, everybody's entitled to those thoughts and to this way to see life. And everybody should be entitled to express himself 
and must be respected and they must give respect to the others that don't think like them. If it's one thing that brings America together, and on that they have a little bit of experience, my friend, is that 87% of Americans believe that food is a right. Mm -hmm. When you see now in this pandemic, every single state, we saw hunger lines. We saw Americans waiting in line sometimes for hours. I can tell you that on those lines were Republicans, in those lines were Democrats, in those lines were independents. At the end, I don't care. In those lines were Americans that they needed of our help, of our respect, and of our empathy. When I go to a state, I go to a state to help the people. We don't ask what party they are. We don't ask what they're leaning politically. Yeah. It's only Americans helping Americans. And when you see that food, longer tables, win the day, brings Americans together. And that's actually one of the only bills that got in the last two years of President Trump, bipartisan support in Congress, which is the FIT Act, which is still didn't pass for different reasons, but still everybody supports it and eventually is going to pass in the next few months, which is we put 3,000 restaurants working, across America, where every dollar we got donated, instead of uh, us opening our own kitchens that we rent or we build field kitchens, we thought who better than restaurants to feed Americans yeah. in a moment that the restaurant industry was shut down. We channeled that money through the restaurants. No restaurant got rich, but we were able to pay them for the meals. Yeah. The restaurants did amazing meals. They will be able to pay their employees, the teams that work, the volunteers, they will be able to pay rent, they will be able to pay the farmers, they will be able to, to, to pay every single thing that has to happen to feed people in the process, on our way to 50 million meals, in the process we put almost $200 million in the hands of those restaurants. Amazing. In the process, we didn't only feed Americans, but we helped the economy keep going. Yeah. We show Congress, we show the White House, how every federal dollar in emergency could be spent, not throwing money at the problem. Even I would say feeding Americans is not throwing money at the problem, but investing in a smarter solution, yes. which is in the process of feeding the people in need, let's keep the economy moving. Yes. And this is the way we need to be thinking as food. Something like we'll always like happen on Thanksgiving and in other occasions where America celebrates the goodness of the earth, the bounty of the land, and where we all come together to give thanks very much, to be in a table with family members, with loved ones, giving thanks to the food we have in an amazing American tradition that must we all need to work harder to make sure that Thanksgiving happens every single day of the year. And where never again one American child will go home hungry, will go to bed hungry. And I do believe if there is the way uh, if there is the will, there always will be the way. And where we learn that good policy will always be good politics, that every single American will always support. That's a mother, uh, what party they support. Yeah. And that's the way we should be building this uh, beloved America of ours. Yeah, I think you're totally right on that, man. And And like this... One of the things that, I mean, you work in the industry, but I think, you know, I obviously love going to restaurants, but one of the things that came about like during this pandemic, when you started to see um, restaurants, you, you know, were closed, were closing or open it, like they started to reduce their hours and it makes you realize how much you appreciate, like especially your local restaurants and like how they're the backbone of the, of like your, of the culture of like getting together, you know, all the, the places that you regularly go to. It was super sad to see some of those places close and then being able to support them in some way. Like, you know, we started to just do all the meals at these local places just to keep it going. Like, you know, I love that you were coming up with a way to keep some of those places going, man, because it really is like the foundation. I feel like one of the foundations of our, of, of America is, is like the, the food industry here. The restaurant world is our world. I believe that uh, was a Frenchman in 1826. And believe me, I don't quote Frenchmen in the open often. Uh, <laughs> it's, the, it's the culinary competition between oh, yeah. Spain and France. Oh, yeah. But this guy was very brilliant. His name is Brigitte Savarin. And 
he had this phrase that probably you heard. Tell me what you eat, and I will tell you who you are. Mm. We, we are what we eat. Eating is becoming one of the most uh, amazing ways to express who you are, um, what, what, what country, what land, what, yeah. what, what world you want to live in. And I sincerely believe that uh, one of the things we need to be doing is that we take food for granted. Yeah. Uh, is many, many people that make food happen. Uh, we have a huge percentage of Americans and people around the world that they dedicate themselves to providing food. And this is more than the restaurants and the chefs. This is the entire chain that goes from the final guest all the way back to the guys that make the seeds, to the farmers, to the guys that deliver the food, to the guys that uh, uh, is so many different people that are part of feeding the world. Uh, and, and we need to make sure that the people that feed America, that the people that feed the world are able to feed themselves. In the moment, we are able to solve that equation. I do believe our cities, our communities, America, the world will do so much better. Right now, everybody is talking and is being used politically uh, by one party or the other, depends who is in power, of what's happening in the border. Mm -hmm. I, I, everybody can have their own ideas and maybe some of them will be right and some of them maybe they are not right because no all the information is there. What we see happening in the border right now uh, doesn't have anything we do with Biden now. Like it didn't have anything to do with uh, Trump before. What happened is that we have countries very close to America that they've been going back to back to back to back hurricanes that destroy the entire food production. That these not only they didn't have food, is that they lost their jobs, they lost their houses, they lost their way of living. And what will you not do to feed your children? And at the end, I try to be pragmatic. Instead of having factories all around the world, I will, if I was an American politician or president, to make sure that we do well in America, taking care of our citizens and our veterans and the homeless. But why we don't build more factories in the countries surrounding America by making those countries better and stronger and creating jobs near America? Yeah. We make America better. We make America safer. We make sure that this food production, not only in America, but also in the countries surrounding us, all of a sudden, those, Ameri those countries are doing well. We are doing better. All of a sudden, we don't have a problem in the border. Yeah. You see, we can be politicized and fight about things, or we can be supporting leaders and politicians that come with ideas that are not finger pointing at the other but ideas that will solve the problems that we are facing in real time. Food is an amazing way to find uh, the ways to see that food is not the problem for us to solve, but the opportunity for America to seize. Let's feed America, let's feed the world, and the process we are going to be creating economic growth everywhere. We can look at the future, we hope, and, and that hope and will bring uh, very good things to Jose, all of us. I feel like you should be the minister of food, man. What's going on? These are like brilliant ideas. Can't you just do it? Well, one of the uh, is many good people out there um, uh, uh, in America uh, coming up with uh, smart ideas over the years. I told you about the Fit Act, which was simple. Let's make FEMA in emergencies mm -hmm. support this idea of World Central Kitchen uh, to immediately put restaurants to cover the needs when an emergency happens. Uh, Tim Scott from South Carolina, Republican. Uh, Kamala Harris, Senator back then, Vice President now. They came together to support that idea. Davis, Congressman from Illinois and Hood from Texas, Republicans next to McGovern from Massachusetts and Thompson from California. They were together in the House supporting that same idea. Yeah. But let me tell you what we have to do with food. We need to make sure that Americans, we are fed better that Americans are not only fed good food, but nutritious food. We make sure that food stops doing the problem, creating obesity and health issues. We should stop throwing money at the problem, which is fixing uh, Americans when we get older and we are sick versus empowering young children to have a good, uh, a good meal from the let go, making sure that we invest in a healthier 
uh, better fed uh, America. We need to make sure that the president of the United States has a person next to him that becomes a national security expert on food issues. We need to make sure that every single department beyond the Department of Agriculture, I love Secretary Bilsen, but food is much more than that. Food should be the Department of Health. Food should be Homeland Security. Food should be the uh, urban uh, and housing uh, department. Uh, food should be the Department of Transportation. Why? Because every one of those departments will play a very important role if we make them work together. together. Yes. So we are trying, many people, we are trying to make sure that the previous administration, I was working with the Trump administration, I'm working, I'm trying to work like many other people now with the Biden administration. Already we see good ideas that maybe are happening in the month, uh, uh, in the month ahead. But we need to start having a whole different yes. uh, way to see food. Food can be the beginning, I'm telling you, of a better America, I, creating jobs, creating economic opportunities, solving health issues, solving hunger issues, and beyond. I, I, totally, I totally agree with you. I think it's a special position that you're talking about, and I nominate you. Now, uh, another, first of all, you look good, man. You look good. Did you lose weight? I lost in the last year 76 pounds. I was at I was at 296 and I went down to 220 and now I'm, I'm trying to get to 200 pounds. Dude. Uh, uh, that's why I'm having my vegetables. Yes. Uh, uh, my, <laughs> my, my fruits. Yep. <laughs> uh, uh, and I hope uh, we don't have any children uh, looking at this podcast. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, but but uh, this is what I'm doing. How did I'm you do it? Used to- How did you do it? Well, I, I eat, I, I, I eat, but I eat, uh, I, I, I listen, I, I, nobody eats better than me on planet earth. Uh, yeah. I, I, I spend time. I love it. I, I, I get, uh, razor clams from Massachusetts and, 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 and I get, uh, abalone from, from Monterey and Santa Barbara. And I, 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 I I'm always, I want to know where my things come from. Sure. I have a love. Uh, a lot of connections. I'm very lucky. It would be stupid for me not to use of course. that love I have to know where my food comes. So what I eat is, is damn good. But even if you eat good food, if you eat too much of it, yeah. you're doomed. That's yeah. a matter. It's not about eating. It's also about eating. So, But I'm including a lot of vegetables in my diet, a lot of lentils, a lot of chickpeas. Even some people in your staff don't know uh, what uh, hummus is. That's but I can give him a, yes. I will not use it against you, Tom. Please, or please, your, thank you very or much. your team. Thank you. Um, uh, and 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 that's what I've been doing. Obviously, I've been doing some fasting that I recommend people to look into it. But you should always do it uh, with some uh, medical uh, guidance and care. But I go sometimes for twenty-one days, uh, and uh, I'm only having two, three hundred calories a day. Whoa. Believe it or not, this is very good in the sense of when your body uh, you are overweight means you have too much fat in your body. Yeah. Fat is energy. And in the moment you do this, is one moment that you, your body, which is very smart, it starts burning that fat, covering the, the calories need, uh, you, you, you need to keep moving. you do this in a, the process. A 21 day fast? Yeah, I did uh, two 21 day in the last six months alone. Wait, how, what, what does that look like? Like what is, what happens? You don't eat anything on those 21 days? I eat 300 calories a day, um, some light soups of vegetables. Wow. Uh, and and you're you, fine. You can sustain. I, actually, the day that it's time to break the fasting, actually, you don't even want to eat anymore. Wow. You feel, you feel amazing. You feel full of energy. Uh, you don't have any pain in any part of your body. Your muscles are telling you, hey, baby, I'm, I'm powerful. Why you yeah. don't? Why don't why you don't go over the rim and, and do a slam dunk on the basketball court? I know some, I know some people try to do that. Uh, 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 yeah. You know, uh, I, I, I don't want to use this against you either. No, um, I don't know who you're talking but, about. So keep going. Um, uh, you know things like that. Things like that. Uh, but but I feel very very good, very powerful, and actually I cannot be a guy that talks about eating better and a healthier America when myself, maybe I'm not the perfect example. So this for me also was very important to- That's awesome. To, you know, to, be, to show that Jose. for me it's easy because I have the ways and means to do it. Yeah. I know for a lot of working people, uh, working Americans, that's not something uh, maybe they can do, but that's why we all must do better True. to try to encourage and provide uh, the right, uh, where we should be eating everything and we should be enjoying life. But right. 
we need to be sometimes eating less of everything of we have our our disposable and what we eat must be more vegetables and more fruits which by the way compare the meat we talked before to yeah. a pineapple yeah. you put the pineapple in your mouth and in the moment you are looking at the pineapple the smell is so amazing the smell is so powerful and the pineapple is telling you hey baby why are you don't eating me yeah. i'm like because i'm looking at you and i already love you i don't know if i want to eat you and the pineapple says eat me eat me and as you're bringing that pineapple into your body it's like the nose is exploding with all those aromas that the pineapple is bringing and then you put it in your mouth and it's cold and it's sweet and it's sour at the same time and your tongue is like going crazy and it's like jose what are you doing to me i say i don't know and then you put it and your teeth go and they break into the flesh of the pineapple and your teeth are like, oh my God, this is an amazing feeling. And then from the moment this goes into your body yeah. to the moment goes inside the stomach, every single second is fascinating. And quite frankly, um, yeah, if you have a pineapple or a mango or an apple, it's an amazing feeling and sensation and they feel respected. We need to give more respect to Jesus. those vegetables. We need to give more respect to those uh, fruits. They tell me sometimes, who say, why people sometimes don't respect us? Why people complain about cucumber or spinach? They have feelings too, people. <laughs> they must be treated with respect. You're totally right. And if you treat them with respect, they will treat you with respect back. And then you will be good. You will be nutritious. You will be healthy. You can take care of yourself. And more important, you can take Dude. care of the people you love because then we live forever and ever amen yeah, amen uh, you mode i'm gonna go get a mango right after this shit um i i'm neck and neck with you i'm 218 and i'm trying to get to 200 also so i will uh i will keep you posted okay. on how that goes we're we gonna check on each other i think we should uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do one thing i'm gonna send you my scale connection okay. and uh, you're gonna follow uh my my weight as i hope is going down okay and you're gonna send me yours okay and then uh when we reach 200 uh we do another podcast we do another podcast and also can i use the fact that i know you now to like when i go to dc can i hit you up to eat with you when i travel abroad and there's like an awesome chef there can i be like jose i'm in madrid i'm in rome can you okay I mean, everybody knows Tom, so I don't yeah, think you yeah. need to call me. I think I do. I mean, you you only need to go somewhere and say, I'm Tom, and I say, uh, talks? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Because people maybe think talks is your last name. Uh, I haven't tried that yet, uh, so I'll definitely uh, give that a shot. Yeah, you say, I'm Tom. Uh, and you uh, you need to tell them I'm Tom and I'm friend of Jose. Jose, okay. And if they don't kick you out of the restaurant, well, it means it works, even if they don't know how Tom is or who Jose is. But Do I have permission know, to start dropping a, your name? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I, I that's don't. That's it. No, <laughs> stop talking. I'm already doing it. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. So, do uh, it. Do it. And things will happen. I don't know if Jose Andres told me to tell you, know. you that I'm here. That's what I'll start saying. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what is, can I ask you this? What is a cuisine? So we all know the world's most famous cuisines, right? Like I'm saying the French, Italian, the Spanish. and What is a cuisine that I might not have thought of trying that you go, you have no idea what this place makes, what this food, you should try this food? Because I figured like you have insight that I definitely don't have on food. Listen, uh, it's, it's so, so many places, yes. right? But uh, I just came back from, uh, well, it was last October, but since it was uh, sure. yesterday. Feels like yesterday. In this little island called Providencia, mm -hmm. um, like in the Caribbean, uh, very close to Nicaragua, even belongs to Colombia. And this is the uh, San Andres, the Archipelago de San Andres. I don't know how to pronounce Archipelagos in English. And, and in, in, in San Andres and, and in the island of Providencia, these two islands close to each other, we went there to help with uh, one of the hurricanes, uh, Eta and Iota. They have this one dish, and it's called Rondon. Rondon. R -O R-O-N-D-O-N. R -O -N -D -O -N. Mm -hmm. And it's a fascinating stew that has uh, fish, can be a red snapper, uh, sometimes has lobster, local Caribbean lobster, has conch, 
which is fascinating, but then has root vegetables like uh, yuca, like malanga. Uh, they can use others uh, like potatoes. They use uh, pig's uh, tail that mm. has been salty before and then they cook it. It uses coconut milk. And, uh, 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 and, and I'm not going to lie to you. It's just fascinating to see the making, as I saw, of a very big pot with all those ingredients mm -hmm. under the expert guidance of this chef who specializes specifically on that dish. And what was fascinating for me is that I didn't even heard about that dish, yeah. even less eating that dish. And I left from that mission, feeding people, but in the process learning. And that's the moment that you only realize that as more as you know, and as more you think you know, and as you grow older, you realize that you know nothing. Yeah. And this is the fascinating thing about life, about cooking, that if you are open, the world is full of opportunities for us to still, as we grow old, to be fascinated with all the things we don't know and that still those things wants to tell us everything we don't know. And I love that dish, Rondon. I love that beautiful part of Colombia, San Andres and Providencia. And this will be a place I will recommend anybody go because you will be fascinated like I was of things you didn't even knew wow. or you read about because nobody has been uh, writing about them. And this will be the last place comes to my mind that will be a fascinating trip into a world we are even aware. You make every dish, any, you make eating an apple sound like an, like an amazing experience. I think we should just have, there should just be audio books of you just being like, have you had a banana? It is a, an amazing experience. You peel the banana. I mean, I want to just listen to you talk about just anything, a glass of water. I'm going to drink a fucking gallon of water if you talk about water. I was talking about a glass of water recently. Okay. I was I was invited. Uh, I, this is one of the talks I give sometimes. And water is fascinating. I'm not going to bother you with that because it takes me like an hour talk. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, and a glass of water can be the beginning of amazing dishes. But uh, Waffles and Mochi is this new show on Netflix. Yeah. That is led by uh, Mrs. Obama. Yes. Who she, she plays a character. She's Mrs. Mm -hmm. And I was invited to be on the first show where I made gazpacho, the, the very traditional soup, which is fascinating. It's, it's a salad that happens is liquid. It's mm -hmm. fascinating concept. But in the last show, I think I make sancocho, which is uh, one dish that is very popular in many cultures. It's very popular in Puerto Rico. But I remember that I was talking to Waffle and Mochi about the power of a glass of water as the beginning of culinary dreams. So I'm not going to tell you more about it. I'm going to tell you, go and watch. I'm going to go watch. Waffle and Mochi. Okay. Uh, on Netflix. With, uh, with your family, uh, with your friends. And quite frankly, it's a show that seems is done for children. But actually, I think it's a show that any grown-up will enjoy. Because Waffle and Mochi only makes us believe that being uh, uh, searching for the things you don't know in the world can be one of the most fascinating uh, mind uh, uh, states of mind that we can be to make sure that we enjoy this amazing uh, planet of uh, ours every single minute we're on it. You're a fascinating dude. Um, muchísimas gracias, Jose Andres, Chef Jose Andres. Uh, of course, World Central Kitchen. If you guys want to check that out, it's an it's an incredible organization of the many restaurants. Think Food Group is your uh, organization that has a whole host of restaurants. Uh, we'll check out that show on Netflix. Look, we're going to send each other pictures of our scales. And um, I'm dropping your name internationally on the tour I'm going on, just so you know. I, I remember uh, YMH is Young, young Man Hungry. hungry. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> and we should, do, we should do the podcast only on food, too. Young Man Hungry. I, I would love to. I would love to podcast with you, eat <laughs> with you, hang out with you anytime. Anytime. Thank you, sir. Let's, thank you, Tom. Thank you.